I was president of the Shock Society in 2011, and my current title is I'm the founding director of the Emory Critical Care Center. I also serve as professor of surgery, of anesthesiology, and of biomedical informatics at Emory University. And I also serve as editor-in-chief of the journal Critical Care Medicine. And I'm a Cirrus standardized instructor pilot. Now, my first memory of the Shock Society was actually deciding to submit an abstract. It was probably early 1988. Uh, I had become a young assistant professor at Hopkins. And unlike many of my colleagues who had taken time out for the lab during their residency, I had a seven-year, eight-year, nine-year hiatus from the lab. I had um, gone straight through the residency, and then there were the last two years of medical school before that, so I was out of touch and out of practice. I was given a 220-square-foot laboratory with not much in it. Uh, started doing some experiments and started to make sense out of the field of cellular shock. Put together some early results and said, where should I go with them? I talked to my mentor, a guy named Greg Bulkley, since retired as a surgeon. He said, you know, there's this neat society called the Shock Society, and people get to talk to people there, so why don't you submit to it? I went to the Lake Geneva meeting and have been coming back ever since. Well, the question is, what's the purpose of a society? And at the end of the day, it's to bring people together. They might be like-minded, but they might not be like-minded. And what makes shock different is that it brings together a community of clinicians, community of investigators, and in fact, some administrators. It brings together the most junior student and the most senior investigator around one central problem. And that, of course, is the problem of shock. A momentary pause in the act of dying, a rude unhinging of life, but really the greatest foe we face in the care of patients. What makes shock different is that everybody who comes to this meeting is somehow engaged. And it's not just the people I mention, it's the families as well. My second shock meeting, which was down in Marco Island, was actually the first trip my wife and I took with our then three-year-old daughter. And we have fond memories of the Monday afternoon, which we simply took for ourselves on the beach, letting her get sand between her toes for the first time. At the time I became president of this society, mirrored the time I became president of two other societies, Society of Complex Acute Illness and the Society of Critical Care Medicine. For each of those three presidencies, I was asked to run and then eventually asked to serve as a change agent. Up to that time, the Shock Society had been very nearly a shoebox society. It was run very informally and it was hard to keep track as the society grew of intents and goals of mission and purpose. I was asked to run to really lend some structure to planning the future. Shock made the biggest difference in my career because it allowed me to find the connections between what I was doing at the bedside what I was doing in the laboratory, what I was reading, what I was writing, and what I was thinking. The luxury of being able to connect one's clinical life and one's research life is undersung, but is perhaps the greatest luxury we have in academia. At the end of the day, what drives us is a passion for a question a question that we pursue at the bedside, and a question we pursue in the laboratory. My question is shock. 
As president of the Shock Society, it wasn't a matter of hard decisions. It was a matter of changing intent into action. Perhaps the least uh, uh, impressive but most important change I made was to actually initiate monthly conference calls among the leadership so that we wouldn't be a year behind every time we came to the meeting. It was a discipline that I think people have come to take for granted. But prior to that time, we really didn't have a series of standing committees that met with the regularity that they needed to, to make change. One of my fondest memories of a shock meeting was a meeting that we had down in Durango around the Four Corners area. And by that time, I had become engaged with an embracing of the shock philosophy of bring your entire lab. Uh, I brought two young people who were sometimes at each other's throats, uh, Deb Cabin and Antonio DeMaio. And both of them have gone on to really illustrious careers in the sciences of shock. Deb became a geneticist, Antonio uh, has had an illustrious career in this society and others. But it's a memory of seeing two young people learn to get along and really to enjoy one another's company in and outside the laboratory. The social aspect of being part of a community of investigators sharing higher purpose is I think one of the most important things one gains as a member of this society. <laughs> you know, I think that there are so many fond memories uh, of fun. Uh, the thing that I always enjoy most is getting photos from members of the society who grew up in my laboratory who have then created their own laboratories. And each year they send me their collection of photos of what they did on the Monday afternoon. It is a family of choice, but it's a family that's become extended into the hundreds, if not thousands, over the three decades I've been with the society. I think that to be a member of this society to be an effective contributor to shock, the shock research and the care of patients. It's important for every member to ask themselves, what's your why? Why do you go to the lab each day? Why do you go to the bedside? What is the fundamental question that drives you? I think that the answers of our members are probably as varied as the members are themselves. But I think in order for us to keep moving ahead as an organization, we have to be explicit about that why. We have to be fearless about sharing that why. And we have to engage others in our why.